so, so I didn't have anybody on the list, so I thought I'd say something. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Sorry, we're heading a little bit close here, but uh, that's all right. We're here. Yes, somebody Woo! grabbed that. It made a difference, didn't it? It's warm now. <laughs> it's toasty now. Yeah. But, then I, but I'm warm-blooded, so. All right. Well, let me uh, pray for us. And uh, get started. Uh, Lord God, thank you so much for today. We can gather in this place in your name. And I pray that you will uh, lead us well according to your word as we uh, talk about who you are and uh, your greatness and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. That's great. All right. So I apologize. There's no notes today. Um, so, sorry about that, I just didn't get that down. I'll try to get that done more often, but, um, that's what I thought. <laughs> not today. Should we open the door for... Uh, yeah, maybe that one, or, you know, TC, you know where the... Well, the, he, he had already turned it up because when we first got her, it was it cold. Was freezing. <laughs> now, but this, okay. this, it, this room melts yeah, fast. Yeah, it's, it's one, it's one <laughs> or the other. Yes, it does. <laughs> but yeah, that one, you get the, uh, the nursery noise. This one, hopefully get the, uh, get the flow. All right. That one thing is on six before four packs. I got like eight of these four packs from cold. So the, uh, the title of this topic, this series... Um, is God is. God is. We're going to talk about the nature, the characteristics of God. Okay, what is he like? And of course this comes to the major topic of theology. Theology. And I'm afraid theology sometimes gets a bad rap. People think theology is this um, abstract, far away from practical life. You know, theologians have uh, been known to debate how many angels can stand on the head of a pin. <laughs> That's nonsense. Who cares, right? <laughs> but real theology, good theology, affects how we live. Okay, for example, we are created in the Imago Dei. Who knows what that means, that Latin word? Image. image of God. The image of God. If we are made in the image of God, then who God is, is some way reflects how we should be. Okay? So this is why theology is important. Now, everyone has a theology. Everyone has a theology. Even the atheist has a theology in the sense that theology is basically our view of God and everything. You can sometimes couple theology with philosophy because if there is a God who is responsible for creation, reality, everything that exists, well then everything properly falls under theology. Okay? Sometimes, you know, you use the word philosophy. You can also use the word worldview. In that a worldview is the lens through which we view all of the world. So, our worldview, what we think about the nature of human beings, the nature of God, the nature of creation. Like, for example, um, creation, the world, the plants, the seas, all of these things. Are those resources to be used and consumed or resources to be stewarded and preserved? Well, how we decide about that as Christians comes from Genesis 1 and 2, where God said, rule the earth 
and subdue it. How we view that having dominion, does that mean, okay, you're free to just use it however you want? Or is that a charge, a commission to be stewards and conservers of creation? Which, as we all know, that then filters into politics and how we vote. Okay? Your worldview, your theology. Only he well, can do yes. That. <laughs> all right. That, that's why you need to keep coming to class. <laughs> All right, people watching us online, they have no clue what's going on. That's okay. <laughs> All right, so our theology shapes how we approach everything, and it should be, if it's done well, very practical. So even the atheist has a view of God that they reject. <laughs> if, they're, if, if an atheist is going to deny God, they have to have some concept of a what they're denying. Can somebody read for for me Romans 1 verse 20. Romans 1 verse 20. since the creation of the world what's been made known God's eternal qualities his divine nature his power has been clearly seen okay so that people are what without excuse without excuse in other words Paul says just Creation can lead to a view of God. Yeah, it's gonna die on me. Really? Creation is going to lead to a theology, a view of God. Now, this theology may not be well thought out. Like you, you may have never sat down and, and wrote out your theology. This is what I believe about God. This is what I believe about Jesus. This is what I believe about humans and sin and, and the afterlife and, and all of these things. But it's there. It's there enough so that people have no excuse. Even if it's as simple as I look up at the stars in the sky and realize the, my own insignificance and that there is someone out there that's a theology. Okay? Everyone has a theology. Now, your theology may not be well thought out. It may be inconsistent. It may be inconsistent. In other words, you may have a theology where you have two ideas that are opposed to each other, but you believe them equally. For example, someone might say, well, I don't believe there is a moral absolute. There are no moral absolutes. But then in the same breath, they'll say it is an absolute imperative that we take care of the environment. Right? Conflicting ideas. And sometimes, uh, you know, when we get into discussions about this, you know, we'll, we'll point out each other's inconsistency. So we as Christians want to make sure that our understanding of God is as consistent as possible because, well, God is a God of order, not a God of chaos, right? God is, uh, he is logically consistent. It may be hard to understand, 
like the Trinity, three in one. But we want to do as best we can to understand God rightly. Okay? Any thoughts, questions here at this point? Okay. Either I'm doing a really good job or a really bad job. <laughs> okay, I got four verses here. I need different people to read. One is Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. Sandy? Okay. Philippians 3, 7 and, 7 and 8. Janice? Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Good. And John 17, 1, 2, and 3. Let's see. 17, 1, 2, and 3. All right. All right. Sandy, you have Jeremiah? Uh, what were the verses again? 23 and 24. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far, far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. Okay. So we get to Philippians 3, 7, and 8. Janice. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. And 2 Corinthians 3. We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of, the God, of God. And are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. And in John 17. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the now has come glory your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way you have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. So, what is eternal life? Knowing God. Okay. And in Philippians 3, what is Paul's desire? More than anything else? Gaining Christ. Gaining Christ. Knowing Christ. Okay. And uh, 2 Corinthians 3, we are beholding him. And it's leading to our transformation. Okay? And then Jeremiah, man, we could just spend a lot of time just in that verse. God is talking about this is who, this is the God that I am. Okay? And so this God, he is worthy of our best thoughts. He is worthy of our best thoughts. In other words, far be it from us to be careless in our thinking about him, or cavalier. Now, God is a God of grace. He is a God of mercy. He is a God who accepts the theology of a child who doesn't know a lot of fancy words or anything, but simply cries out, Abba, Father. All right? He absolutely, there, there's, it's not a theology quiz to get into heaven, except the, qu the question, what do you say about Jesus? Okay. But having received his mercy, having been welcomed into his family, having been adopted as sons and daughters, don't we want to understand him? To speak well of him. Uh, for example, you know, our married couples in here. When did you stop learning about your spouse? <laughs> <laughs> you still do. Yeah. 
Yeah, we, we, we don't get the point get to the point and say, okay, I'm done. There's nothing more to learn. There's nothing more to pursue. There's there's no, it's a relationship, and so you want to know them, and you certainly don't want to go around and then speak to other people falsehoods about your spouse because you make assumptions about your spouse because you stopped learning about your spouse, right? And same with God. We want to pursue him, and he is gracious, and he puts up with a lot. I, I've I've said for a long time, our theology, the best of our theology, is like a child's uh, scribbles that the father still puts on his fridge. Parents, you ever, you ever do that? You ever get something from your kid? You're like, Mommy, Daddy, this is you. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been so thin. <laughs> right. <laughs> but... We honor our child's efforts, and we put it on our fridge. And I, and I think our theology is often like that. Our theology is an act of worship. We're, we're saying, this is who my God is. And we're, you're going to get it wrong. Now, the goal is to not get it so wrong that you end up outside the fences, right? Right? Which is another reason why we do theology, to make sure that we are describing God to the best of our abilities as he has uh, described himself in Scripture. Okay? Thoughts, questions? So. It seems like all these verses, they identify a change of attitude, first of all, if I want to. Now, of course, some, some of the verses identify God and all his glory and who he is. But as you, talk, as you talked about in the beginning, theology is my point of view. So you've got to come to the point where you turn to look towards God. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really good point. I don't know if it's your point, but it's for a point that I want to make. So, we often we will talk about orthodoxy. Ortho meaning right. Doxy meaning doctrine. Okay, so right doctrine, right teaching, right theology. Okay? However, orthodoxy by itself is dead. Because James says even the demons believe in God. The demons know who God is. <clears throat> Better than we do. But they don't have orthopraxy right practice. Because they're in rebellion against him, right? Correct? Mm -hmm. All right? So, orthodoxy, you can have all knowledge, but if you're not practicing obedience, what does it matter? It's, it's been said by others that the distance by which many people are going to miss heaven is 18 inches from here to here. Okay? And there's also uh, another ortho we can add up here ortho cardia anyone care to guess what cardia heart. heart that's right if I if I have all knowledge but I don't have love I'm a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal well the practice is what we do the heart is why we do what we do yeah that's the heart of the matter yeah and Phil was talking about uh, 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 the desire, the the affection. If and, and honestly, I mean, we probably we probably all have horror stories of churches that are so caught up on orthodoxy that 
or the praxine or the cardia just go right out the window. You know, gentleness is an underrated fruit of the spirit. Yeah, it, it seems like I, I think back to my life, you know, years ago, in that, like Orthodox or you know, and theology. Let me use that word was was scary because the people had had find had shaved down to such a fine point of why we're different, as opposed to why we're alike. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? And they made the uh, here I stand that little shaved different. And it was really important that, you know, that be it we're Methodist or we're Baptist or we're whatever, that, you know, we don't mess with those other people because, and yet it was just such a fine shaved thing that there was a time in my life I thought, well, I can never learn what the balancing act is. You know, yeah. it's, it's just never, ever going to go. And then the things that aren't important became important and it was hopeless. Yeah, majoring in minors. Yeah. You know, and... I think the world, that's what they see now, particularly, you know, because you can drive down any street and there's this church, this church, this church, you know. Yeah. And. Yeah. So what we are hoping, well, so this is why the, our branch of the family tree, mm -hmm. the independent Christian churches, started from a desire to get away from those types mm -hmm. of nitpicking creeds. Okay. A creed being a statement of beliefs. And instead of fighting over the uh, 1718 edition of the Westminster uh, Confession of Faith versus the 1812 revised, you know, I'm like, like, no, no, no. Not Baptist, not Methodist. Not, let's just be Christians. Hence, Christian okay. church. Okay. Um, we often will say, no book but the Bible, no creed but Christ. Now, that's, that's a nice slogan, but then you end up having creeds. <laughs> Statement of beliefs, uh, you know, and stuff because this restoration movement to get back to this unity then fractured into three different denominations. So, <laughs> so you have the Disciples of Christ, which have a denominational headquarters structure, the independent Christian churches, which is what we are. And then you have the, the other branch, which is the non-instrumental churches of Christ. Maybe, you know. One, yeah, one more question, and this is kind of trivial, I guess. But have you noticed that the trend now anymore in churches, they're renaming themselves? Like mm -hmm. instead of the First Baptist Church of Danville, it's Westbridge Church. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think of that, that trend is... Theologically following along, also where churches are discovering, you know, saying that we're not doing this, or do you think it's just a rebranding of an old way of doing things? I think it's well. For one, people care less about denominational labels, like uh -huh. the the people they're trying to reach. It used to be you move into a town, you say, "Okay, I grew up Baptist. I'm looking for the Baptist church." Uh -huh. Now more people is like, okay, I'm just looking for a good church. All right? Baptist, Methodist, do you have a good children's program? Do you have a good preaching? Do you have, you know. So people care less about, so they're not a selling point anymore. And I think on the flip side, at some point, they're a, a hindrance because, oh, I heard horror stories about this Baptist church when I grew up. And so I'm going to avoid all Baptist churches. Well, that's not really the right way to go about it because mm -hmm. one, you, you, this might have been a toxic church, but this one over here is just perfectly fine. So let's remove a potential obstacle mm -hmm. for people. But a lot of it does come down to marketing. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, Sorry. In some ways you do. Okay. So orthodoxy, orthopraxy, orthocardia. Um, and honestly, you can't really claim that you are orthodox if you don't have orthopraxy, orthocardia. There's plenty of people who's like, oh yeah, but the, the guy teaches correct doctrine. He's a huge jerk. He, he's, he's hurt people and destroyed lives. <laughs> you know, let, let's... So how much did he really believe the orthodoxy if it never affected? Good theology 
should shape your biography. Good theology, right theology, should shape your biography. If you really believe what you claim to believe, it should bear fruit in your life and how you talk to people, how you interact. Now, we're not perfect. People have their journeys where the spirit is sanding down those rough edges. That's my story. That's your story. Yet, Jesus is pretty clear that in the course of your life, there should be a trajectory of fruit. Or you can say you, you, you can judge them by the fruit. I expect a new Christian to act like a new Christian. I expect somebody who's been walking with Christ for 30 years to not be acting like a new Christian. Does that make sense? Right? Uh, John was preaching on Joshua and the spies. You know, ten were bad, two were or yeah, ten were bad, two were good. I thought he mentioned Caleb's name there, and he didn't. <laughs> so the Israelites, they saw they saw the power of God, but they didn't trust God. Joshua and Caleb trusted God and so they knew God could give us the land okay their theology was different than everyone else's all right so what we're going to do is we're going to look at different <clears throat> aspects of God parts of his nature parts of his character and when I'm talking about here I'm talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. This is uh, God's divine nature. The, the what all three of them share in common. Okay? Um, and we're going to use, we're going to say God instead of Father, Son, and Spirit every single time. But we understand this is a triune God we're talking about. Um, I also need to, to say this real quick. When you talk about theology, you will hear... The words biblical and systematic. Biblical theology is we're going to start with the text. All right. So, for example, the passage in Jeremiah: "Am I a God who's who's near and not a God who's also far?" Okay. What does this text tell us about God? So, you know, what is what is Matthew's view of God? What does Matthew emphasize that may be different than Mark, Luke, or John? Not, not opposed, but a different emphasis. What do the Gospels <laughs> emphasize that might be a little bit, or phrase, differently than Paul phrases things? So I'm not saying they're opposed. I'm saying they, you know, two sides of a coin. So, biblical theology, the questions come from the text. Systematic theology, the questions come from us to the text. So, uh, a theology of, of being pro-life. There's not a chapter and verse that says, this is the exact point of conception. We are asking the question, when does, when does a human become a human? And we're looking at the text saying, can you, can you help us out here? And we find things like, I was knit together in my mother's womb. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay? But the question starts out here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So systematic theology... <clears throat> One of the reasons systematic theology will change over time is because at different times we're asking different questions. So, and we're speaking to different audiences. So, for example, uh, in the Middle Ages, people were living under a feudal system where a king owned the 
ground that you were born on and owned you pretty much. <laughs> and, and you owed the king your existence. And so certain theologians use that as an illustration for the atonement, what called became known as the satisfaction theory of atonement, where God is our feudal king, we owe him everything. When we rebel against him, well, now we've incurred a debt that we can't satisfy. So they were using their contemporary setting to put into words the theology of the Bible. We don't live under a feudal system. The illustration doesn't make as much sense to us. So systematic theology, you're going to see changes over time as different cultures ask different questions. As they try to draw on their contemporary experience to put into words, just like Jesus told parables to explain the kingdom of God. Well, we don't live in an agrarian society as much. I mean, yeah, we are rural, but, you know, I'm not a shepherd. Shepherd leaves the 99, goes search for the one. I don't know. They're all, they're all in the, in the pen. They, <laughs> I fence off my property. They're not getting out of there. <laughs> Different cultures. It, it doesn't mean that the content, the nugget is changing. And teachers, you got, you understand this, uh, you know, in the nineties, the way you taught the illustrations you use, if you're still using those in the 2000s, <laughs> right? Okay. Generations also. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Missionaries. There you are, Sammy. You're usually sitting over here. Sorry. <laughs> on this side. <laughs> Um, oh, what, what was the, the, it was this missionary video where there, these people were trying to explain the gospel to this indigenous people group and they were running into opposite troubles. Like, how do we, how do we get this to connect? And then they, they found out that there was this, um, the peace child. Is that, does that strike a bell? That this tribe had this cultural uh, ritual where when they make peace with this tribe over here, they will send their child to that tribe. And so this way of saying, we're, we'll, we're never going to attack you because you have one of our kids. Okay. And when they learned about that, they were able to describe the gospel events in those terms which just like, boom, light went on. Right? <clears throat> so, that, that's where systematic and biblical theology, they're sisters. Okay? Unfortunately, you can't do systematic theology without the Bible. Mormons do that. They, they're not using, <laughs> they're using the Book of Mormon. Right? Mm -hmm. Islam... They're doing their systematic theology. So just because someone says they're doing theology doesn't mean they're doing Christian theology. The, the few times that I've heard uh, Bible students, Bible college students talking about systematic theology class, mm -hmm. they made like, it sounds so hard. Well. This class was so hard. Yeah, because Christianity has been around how many years? Exactly. 2,000. 2,000 years of theological thought on topics ranging from what we call theology proper, which is when we're talking about God's nature, okay? And then you got the Trinity, which that's difficult. Yes. Christology, not only who Jesus is, what does Jesus do? Uh, which is getting to salvation or atonement theology. But in there, you have to have an understanding of sin as well as human beings. Okay. 
And, and these these are all the really important stuff. We haven't even yet gotten into uh, angels and demons, the afterlife, heaven and hell. Okay, ecclesiology, the study of the church and the people of God. So systematic theology, when you're trying to get into, especially if it's a semester class, <coughs> one semester to get, it's drinking from a fire hose. All right. Um, but a, a lot of times it's to cover the very basics. And then later on, you have a, a specialized class on Christology, life of Christ or and they get into uh, the the contextual things of talking about Christ, and, you know, like you said, the culture. Oh yeah. And all that. Oh yeah. So, oh. so I had a class on Christology, the the study of Christ, and one of our assignments we had to read a book by a like a modern author who we disagree with, because. You have what's called liberation theology coming from uh, South America. Uh, basically, what does the Bible say and how does Christ interact with conditions of economic oppression? Okay, that, that was hard. That was hard to get into. Because at that point in my life, I, I wasn't very aware. I mean, I was, you know, white middle class kid going to seminary. On student loans, that's wasn't my experience. You have uh, feminist, feminist theology trying to to look at what does you know even Christians like what what does the Bible say about women today, right? And how does you know is is Christ basically only for men, or how does he you know? Hebrews says that Christ was made like his brothers in every way, but was without sin. He wasn't made like women in every way. Right? So, asking those questions. So, yeah, there's, that's when you get to, to modern, okay, and how do you answer the atheist or the uh, intersection, intersectionality Questions that the students of DePaul are asking today, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had a whole class on contemporary theology, uh, which that was one of my majors. But contemporary theology begins in the 1800s. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, we're not going there with this class. All right. <laughs> That's, that's not the plan. Our plan is to talk about what the Bible says about God. Okay? Now, we, I may point out how some of those intersect. And if you want to go deeper, we can talk and I can connect you with resources to go deeper. So, I don't want everybody to freak out. It's like, oh, okay, I'm in the wrong spot. <laughs> now... To that end, we are looking at, and coming up in, in April, we will have a pilot for what we're calling tentatively GCC Institute, where we are going to offer <clears throat> semi-college level classes that instead of one hour on a Sunday, it'll be like three hours on a Monday evening with readings and assignments, and it's going to go deeper into this, not master's level, not graduate level, but undergraduate level, because some people want that, all right? So we're, we're doing a pilot, and that class is going to be on worldviews, you know, so how does Islam view theology? How does Muslim... How, what are some of the worldview, hidden worldviews in our world today that we interact with, like materialism? That's, that's a worldview at conflict with Christianity, isn't it? You cannot serve both God and money. Yet it's one that Christians, sometimes we're... Yeah. So, if that's something you're interested in, 
the pilots coming out in April is we're kind of getting our feet wet. And then in the fall, we're going to have um, a series of different classes. So, okay. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Okay. So, God is. Now we've got the introduction out of the way. <laughs> But this is an easy one. God is omnipotent or all powerful. God is omnipotent. What does it mean when we say that God is almighty? He is all powerful? What exactly does that mean? And the Greek and Roman gods and goddesses, they were very powerful. But they were not all powerful. Compared to the God of Scripture, they were very limited. Okay? They would actually, you'd have these various gods and goddesses going to war against each other. Sometimes even being killed. That's not our God. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. All right, so let me get verses 1, 2, and 3. Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Okay. In the ancient world, other religions have creation stories, creation myths. Okay. A lot of times these myths involve the gods or the gods fighting and killing previous gods. So the, the myth of the Greeks, Zeus kills the Titans. He actually kills his father, Kronos, and then creates. In one of the Babylonian myths, uh, the, the main guy, I think it was Marduk, kills his mother, Tiamat, and then from her body creates the world. How does, how does our Bible start? Are there any other gods? No. Just one God. <clears throat> does he... Fight? Does he battle? Does he have to wage war to create? He speaks. He speaks. Yeah. Universe, one spoken. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, we call this creation ex nihilo, out of nothing. So God commands, I mean, there, there's, there's just Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God speaks into nothingness, and the universe obeys. God says, exist, and the universe says, yes, sir. That's power. That's power. When Jesus returns, he will destroy his enemies with the sword of his mouth. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes we like to, or the way we talk about things is though Satan and God are on equal footing. No. No. Now, okay, well then why doesn't God just destroy Satan? Well, he has his plans, his purposes. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> But what does it mean when we say that God is omnipotent, he is all-powerful? It means that he has the ability to do whatever he wants that is logically possible to do. He has that ability. Now, when I say logically possible, some people, this is like the little theologian's game here. 
You know, can God create a rock that's too heavy for even him to lift? Or can God create a married bachelor? Okay, those are word games. Those are things that are logically incoherent, impossible. A square circle. No, by the very names and the very definitions, those things don't exist. All right? Some people would will go on and say, no, no, God can create a square circle. God can do whatever is logically possible to do. He had wipe out the universe. Yes. Bring the universe into existence. Yes. Raise someone from the dead. Yes. He has the ability, but it also means he has the freedom. He has freedom. There is there are no obligation outside obligations on God. God is not obligated to us. He is not obligated to a law higher than himself. There is nothing outside of God that compels God to do anything. So sovereignty saying Yep. Yeah. Okay. You're absolutely right. His sovereignty. He is in charge, not us. So, practical. When it comes to prayer, God is not obligated to answer your prayers. Now, some treat prayer as though it were a magical formula. If I say it the right way... Hmm then God is obligated to answer me the way I want. Like when you say pray in Jesus' name. Right. Now it will be answered. Yeah. No. Now what, what I mean what I mean by that is there is no outside obligation. The only thing that God answers to, the only thing that limits what God might do is his own character. So we say God is love. Here, I'll stop sighing and see the board. <laughs> Ability, freedom, character. Yeah, 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Yeah. So out of his love, out of his own faithfulness, he's going to listen to our prayers because he said he would listen to our prayers. But there is no external but there's no, okay, I, God, I'm going to appeal to the law that's above you. There is no law above him. Okay? So when we interact with God, we have to remember that he is a personal being. You know, what I mean by that is, is you are in a relationship with someone else. Not a force that you can control. Okay? Do so you notice how often people got afraid when Jesus was around? Because they realized he, we can't control him. The winds and the seas listen to him. And then all Peter saying, oh, not, not you, Lord. You're not going to the cross. You don't control him. Satan can't control him. Nature can't control him. His own character, that he is a loving God. There's things that God is not is going to choose not to do. But it's because he wants to. Or doesn't want. Is it? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah. Just, this is really cool. Uh, A.W. Tozer, book I'm reading now, you know, it says that God is perfectly these things and infinitely. Mm -hmm. like, you know, like there's no love outside. Mm -hmm. Like uh, he entails, encompasses all of love, all of justice, all of mercy, you know. Yeah. And all of those things agree with each other. Like when God judges, Mercy and all love and all those other things agree 
with his judgment of those people and vice versa, you know. Right. Cool. Yeah. So when, we, and he invites us to ask, he invites us to pray. He says, he says, pray like the woman who goes to the judge. Mm -hmm. And even though this is a corrupt judge who doesn't care, she has no leverage on him. She has nothing that he wants. And she just wears him down. <laughs> God said, how much more when you come to a God who loves you? Okay? Yet, even still, God is going to answer our prayers as a good father. Now, as a, as a father, I know there's things that even if my son wants, I'm not going to give it to him. He's 12 years old. I'm not getting him a Harley Davidson. He's going to hurt himself. Okay? I'm not getting him a flamethrower. You know? He may really want it. He may constantly come to me, Father, please, I appeal to your love. But that would be unloving to do it. So, so yes, he says, pray in my name. Well, if we're praying something in Jesus' name, we're also praying something within Jesus' will. So the one, the one that I think we all struggle with, and me a lot, is that our prayers for salvation for others. Uh -huh. you know, why? Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> just as God is free... He creates creatures in his image and he gives them freedom. Now, a lot of times there's kind of a question, well, God's sovereignty, if God's sovereign, then how does that work out with human? As though those are opposed. God can only be sovereign if humans are not free. But I think an all-powerful God can accomplish his purposes in and around and through humans making free choices. Especially when you couple that with his omniscience, his all-knowing. So he knows me perfectly, better than I know myself. So for him to know what I would choose in a given circumstance and to arrange things. You know, uh, have you ever heard of the butterfly effect? Okay, it's this theory about the interconnectedness of all things. That a butterfly in Africa flaps his wings moves the air and domino effects, creates wind currents that ends up creating a storm over Florida. Oh, a hurricane. You think God, an all-powerful, omniscient God, knows how to set up the dominoes to accomplish his will without forcing, he just creates the environment for me to choose exactly what I would choose because he knows me so well? So God creates humans with, and and this is, this is all this is what how God wants it. He desired human freedom, and we we might say, well, God, it'd be better if, if humans weren't free if we just fell in line. But for for His own purposes, He created free creatures. I mean, they have moral freedom. They they have the ability to choose for themselves. And he respects that. In fact, I, I think his respect for human freedom explains a lot about why God does what he does. Like, why doesn't God just show up in the sky and just say, hey, here I am? Because if he did that, then there's, okay, you got no choice but to, to see him. When he does this hidden, like you can find him if you look for him then only the people who want to look for him are going to find him. Only those who are seeking and asking are going to come to know him. Where so, does that notion come from? How do you mean? When you said only those who want to see him will find him. Where does that notion come from? The, the wanting to see him? That, there's different opinions on that. There's some who say that that desire only comes if God puts it in there. Right. 
But then there's others who say that, okay, but if that's the case, then people aren't really free. If the only reason why I'm seeking God is because God zapped me and said, Sam, you're going to seek, but your neighbor, Joe Smith over here, I'm not going to zap him, so he's not going to seek. And there's... But they have the opportunity. Yeah, so... And then, and that's that's where you get into an issue that I don't think I can nail down for you. Call it for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I'm reminded of a couple of things. One is we don't always know uh, what God's will is. You know, we pray and we listen, you know, and all that. But we do know what his will is not. And that is, it, Scripture says it is not his will that any should perish, which gets us to the, the point of... Um, personal decision, you know, the freedom to decide. But uh, we were just looking a little bit ago in uh, the first chapter of Romans, and uh, in that chapter alone, repeatedly, it says, he gave them over. You know, we have an opportunity, he gave them over, and they chose. Yeah. He gave them over. I mean, eventually, uh, God's Holy Spirit stops speaking to people because they have a series of saying, no. And also in scripture talks about a person hardening their hearts. God didn't do that. They did it. It was yeah. their choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's uh, the God, God giving people over um, is what we can call the passive wrath of God. In other words, there's Sodom and Gomorrah active wrath. God is sending hailstone flaming hailstones whatever exactly it was and meteorites whatever god is just dis destroying somebody exercising his wrath but sometimes the uh, god's wrath is more of a you want to go go mm -hmm. you know the father the prodigal son the prodigal son said no i'm out of here the father didn't stop him now when the when the son had his epiphany hey Pig slop doesn't taste so good. Where was the father? He runs to meet the son. So what was the best way of teaching that person that lesson? Yeah. And so if if somebody repeatedly rejects God, and and I don't know if we'll get into this later, so I'll just throw it out here. Here. If somebody repeatedly rejects God, says, I don't want anything to do with him. Hell is simply God respecting that person's choice. Yep. You, you, you want, you, you don't want me. You, you want completely free from me. There you go. God, I don't believe hell needs demons with pitchforks and flames and all the Dante's Inferno. Uh, honestly, Hell could be paved with streets of gold. But without God there, humans will make that place hell on each other. I struggled with that when you mentioned it in the podcast. Yeah. When you said heaven could be a pool of fire, but with God. Yeah. And, and people might disagree with me on that, but... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace <laughs> with yeah. Jesus there. We're not touched. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't even smell like it. Yeah. So it's so not like where Jesus is, that's where heaven is. So whatever now, I'm not saying heaven's going to be this suffering type thing. I'm just saying where Jesus is, that's what makes heaven heaven. Okay. <clears throat> And where Jesus is not, or where God says, you don't want to experience my love, my light, my goodness, my mercy, my grace. You don't want any of that. Have at it. Just think of some of the, some of the places of absolute anarchy. Or prison. You know, prison, but without any guards. And along those lines, uh, Sam, uh, there's a scripture that says that wow. in his presence, in the presence of Jesus, in his presence, there's fullness of joy. Yeah. 
So it's not just um, it's not just comfort. Mm -hmm. It's it's joy in His presence. And, but another danger we run is that just from our, every one of us, from our own personal experience, we sin and we our heart. But the, if we more, it becomes easier and we become numb to it. You know, which yes. can be a very difficult and, thing. And and that is an actual biological yeah. fact of how the human brain works. Neurons that fire together, wire together. That's how you develop habits. That's how you develop muscle memory. And if you develop a habit of saying no to God, it becomes easier next time. Not impossible. <laughs> now, the reverse is, up, is also true. You develop a habit of saying yes to God. Obedience becomes more natural. Okay, just got a minute left here. The ultimate takeaway, God is creator, God is sustainer. God will fulfill his purposes. Okay? The end is not in doubt. It's not a toss-up. It's not a will he, won't he, nail-biter at the very end, last-second field goal. <clears throat> No, it's it's written. God wins. It's a no hitter. Yeah. God wins. And that same God we can trust. When he says all things work for the good of those who love him and called according to his purpose, we can trust him. And if, if God tells you no, it's not because he can't tell you yes. We trust him because we believe he's good, and there's a reason for that no or that wait. Um, if you if you watch The Chosen, uh, in season three, there's this very powerful scene between Jesus and uh, little James who walks with a cane. Okay, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but I encourage you so good. when you get there. It's a very, very powerful scene. Mm -hmm. All right? Let me uh, pray for us and be dismissed. Father God, thank you for today, for the chance to... Uh, be here in this place, and uh, I pray that you will uh, be with my brothers and sisters until we can come together again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.